So it's a new course, both for you and for me. I'm doing it for the first time. So the ultimate objective is to, uh, to share what I know about open source development and to, uh, to sort of help you get on board the projects which you in the future may find interesting, both in open source and not in open source. Actually, the most important motivation for me is to, uh, is to put the information which I, which I was able to collect over the last 15 years of working in open source, mostly on GitHub, into some sort of a more or less structured material, which we in the future can share with maybe more students, maybe more people who work with me, uh, in order to teach them and to explain them what is the best way to work in, in a GitHub repository. Actually, I, I decided to make this course because I, uh, I keep explaining the same things over and over again to people who join our projects in GitHub. Most of our projects which we develop in the company and outside of company, they are open source, they are in GitHub. And I have to, to explain to, to people who join many things which they, I expect them to know, I expect them to know after they graduate the university, but they don't. So I have to repeat again and again. So I will tell you these things to you and, uh, and, and hope it will help more people than in this room. At the same time, I, uh, I try to make this course more academic. So it's not going to be just a list of uh, ideas, the list of principles, the list of practical recommendations, but I will try to sort of prove my points, prove my ideas using some papers which I find on different conferences, uh, academic papers, scientific papers. So it's going to be a mix of practical recommendations to you as programmers, but at the same time you will see that there is an academic community which is also concerned about that and they do research and they, they prove certain, some of the points I make. Uh, so what's the structure of the grading for this course? So there are, there are going to be two groups of students. The first group, very small group, uh, the, the students who want to be researchers. Some of you may want to write papers, academic papers, similar to papers which I will show you during the course. So you will get some data from GitHub, you will analyze the data, you will make some conclusions after the data, and then you will write a student paper, three, four pages, and maybe you will even publish them on some conferences. That's the first group of students. The second group of students, they will not be interested in that. For them, I will give you uh, a number of open source repositories where you will submit pull requests. So you will just write some code. If you're not interested in the research, you just make a pull request, write some code in different programming languages, submit pull requests in a way which I teach you. So I will teach you during the course how to do it right. Not just any way, but the right way. So you will practice that. You will practice submitting pull requests. And I will just count those pull requests. If the pull requests are merged, you will get a grading. You will get a grade. So your job will be to uh, submit pull requests and make sure they're they are merged. They are accepted by repositories. I'm talking about our repositories. So I will be one of the reviewers, me and my team. So there will be a group of us, more experienced programmers than you, and you will get some uh, good, interesting feedback from us. So if you want to join the first group, you let me know. If you want to stay in the second group, you let me know. Anybody can be in the second group, but only selected people can be in the first group. So if you join the first group and you start writing academic paper, and I see that you cannot do that for different reasons. Like, for example, I see you're cheating, which some students are doing. You're just, for example, copying the, the, the pieces of the text from other papers and not, not writing the proper papers. I understand that. I see that you don't have enough motivation for being a researcher. I just say you're not allowed in the first group anymore. You automatically go to the second group. In the second group, anybody can stay. So that's the principle of this, of this course. The first group is for some people who are full of enthusiasm and they want to be researchers. Second group is for everybody else. All right, so it's up to you to choose which way to go. The topics for the research I will announce probably later today or maybe tomorrow in the morning. There's going to be a list of topics for the research for the people who want to be in the first group. And you will see them. And if you want, you will decide to become a researcher. Okay? That's the, the idea of separation of the two, two groups of 
of students. So recommendation number one, I believe that open source must be for you, for every one of you, the only way of developing software. Not one of the ways, but the only way. I strongly believe that open source will be in some time, maybe already is for some companies, the only mechanism of writing code. So as you know, there are two, two ways of making code. Proprietary code, where companies write code and they keep the code in their private repositories and their own servers and open source, where just anybody can see the code you write and the company which you work for. More and more companies actually go for the model where everything is open source for them. So even though you work for the company, even though the company pays you for your work, even you work on a payroll, still everything you write stays on GitHub. Everything you write is available to everybody. Microsoft, Google, Facebook, all of these companies, majority of the code, or big amount of code they put in public. And this means different ways of managing the work you do. So writing for proprietary repository and writing for public repository, it's a two different approach. And I believe that you need to uh, practice the open source one. So make your code visible to everybody. In this course, we'll see how difficult it is. But that's the rule number one. So every time you start doing something, the course job, the diploma work, something for, for your company, something for yourself, even though it's some pet project, some, some experiment, make a repository, now we use GitHub, and make sure it's public. Every time it's public. This will teach you how to handle the pressure of open source community, how to be visible to, to a lot of people around you. Who of you have now public repositories with the code? Maybe 50, more, more than 50%. And who of you have private repositories? So you still have private. And what's the reason for making them pub private? Uh, secret? Just secret information. Just secret. Okay, what else? The backend. Like they don't want, uh... the backend. You don't want a backend to be visible, only the front end. And why? and try to break the server. That's, that's reasonable, yes. But if you don't show the code, uh, well, I can, well, we can argue whether it's true or not. Too. Is, it good, is it good or bad to make your background visible? But I, in my case, most of my or all of my you know, web projects where I have the back end and I have the front end, they're still public on the, on the GitHub. So people see my code. And when I write code, I understand it in the beginning. So when I make the code, of course, maybe we're, maybe you're not so sure, no, maybe not so confident about the, the security of the code, but still, making it public, it will encourage you to to uh, to make it stronger, to to deal with the bug somehow. But it, it's an obvious, it, it's it's a reasonable concern. I agree. So uh, people say. In, in, in the research, now I'll show you during the course, you will see many quotes from different papers. So people say that, uh, actually not only say, but they, 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 um, uh, they have the data to confirm that, that uh, there are two reasons basically. One of the, among other reasons, the main reason for people who make their code uh, public is to gain the professional reputation and to show their employees to employers, sorry, to the companies who may employ them in the future, what kind of developers they are. So the more stuff you have on GitHub, the more repositories you write there, the more code you, there, you, you build there, this is bec the, the better you become in the eyes of your potential employer. So they will believe that you are a more serious developer. They can see your code. They can understand what, you, what you're capable of. They will see the reaction of the community to your code. So they will see the number of likes, number of comments, number of pull requests, which other developers send to you. And that will help you to get a better job. So simply put, when you still a student, for example, right now, and even after graduation, every year, every day, when you contribute to GitHub, making some small projects, some frameworks, maybe com contributing to other projects, that's how you grow your reputation. So when you graduate, you don't graduate with an empty GitHub profile, but you have already in the GitHub profile, which you can show to the company where you want to get a job, and the company will trust you way more. So that's the, one of the reasons. Well, for me, this is number one reason. So I agree with this paper. So they're saying, this is 
the common ones. So there are the common reasons, uh, among others, these reasons are the most common. For me, there's the primary reason. In the beginning, that's how it was when I joined GitHub in the beginning. I actually wanted so other people can see what I write and they potentially can pay me more because they, uh, they see my code, they trust me more when I see my work. Actually, for companies, it's also, uh, for, for the companies, even if, if, if the people do it, uh, well, it's not really altruistic. So they say individuals release open source projects and their motivation are often altruistic. So they do it for free, right? So I just, com I just contribute to open source and it doesn't give me anything back. But as you saw before in the previous slide, we don't do it for free. We do it actually for money. So we do it in order to get money a bit later. So I kind of invest my time into building my profile and then in the future somebody will pay me off for this work. But they call it still altruistic. So still people believe that programmers are, we don't care about money, we just do it for free. It's not true. I don't believe in open source doing it for free. So always keep in mind that you're doing it for money. You're doing it but for the future money. Not for the money coming today, but the money you're going to get tomorrow. It's, it's going to be money when you, when, you, when you go to the interview and, you, and, and, the, and you're going to be the candidate for the job and the employer will ask you questions and they will decide how much to pay you, what's going to be your salary. Then at that point, there's going to be money on the table and it's going to be your profile and their money. And the more you get, the richer you become. And that's very not altruistic motivation for doing open source. So, so saying that people doing it mostly altruistic, it's, I kind of disagree with that. But then they say that companies also doing open source, like Microsoft is the number one company in the world by the amount of open source code, Microsoft. It wasn't like that 10 years ago, or maybe 15 years ago. Microsoft was the most closed source company. They didn't share anything. They actually were fighting with Linux for, you, you probably remember that quotes from coming from Microsoft CEOs, uh, Steve Ballmer, if I'm, not sure, if I'm not mistaken. He was saying that Linux is the evil uh, software in the world, so the in Linux is actually causing trouble for the world because it's open source. But now the situation is opposite. Microsoft is number one open sourcer, not, not Linux. Microsoft share way more code than, than Linux has. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, even IBM, so all of these companies. And, and in this paper, they're saying that it's not altruistic motivation. They're not doing it for free, for sure. It's very strategic move. So they do it, I believe, uh, that they are doing it in order to win us, in order to get us, programmers, on board. So the more they open source, the more programmers use that code, which is Microsoft code. And if we use Microsoft code, then we become Microsoft fans, we become Microsoft uh, followers, we become Microsoft programmers. So that's the, the way to acquire the territory where we programmers live. And this is now, I think, the, 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 the competition for the talents, the competition for the brains of programmers. Programmers, they move. We can be anywhere. We can be with Amazon, for example, or we can be with Microsoft. We can use Azure cloud service, or we can use Amazon web services. Which decision to make, it's very hard to acquire our decisions, our minds, through commercials, through promotion, through paid, uh, I don't know, paid commercials on, on, the, on the Google ads. A much better way is to give us the software. Just open the, 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 I don't know, the operating system internals and open the internals of a cloud service, open the code, and we jump in. We just start using it, we, we, we love that code, we become aware of this code, and that's why I think they open it. That's why they make it open source. And the more it will be even more and more, and you eventually will become a member of one of the territories in open source. You will be either in this community or you will be in that community, you will be in some community. It's not gonna be possible for you to be nowhere. You will be in some community, so you will be owned your, your mind will be owned, your time, by either Microsoft or Google or Amazon, one of them. That's what companies are doing. So they are opening everything and just saying, come on in. When you come in, you get attached to it. You become the member of that community. And that's good, I mean, for them. And it's inevitable. It's not bad or good. It's just what's happening now. But recommendation number two, be prepared for the very toxic nature of open source. 
Open source is famous for being toxic. It's a way more dangerous environment comparing to internal development. When you work in the company, you have a very closed community of programmers. You have just a few friends sitting with you in the room, maybe a few programmers in the DevOps department, maybe somebody with another department, but that's it. That's your community. And they all respect you to some extent. They all know you, you talk to them outside of the office, you know them personally. And that's why they, they, they control themselves. So they're not gonna uh, be rude to you. They're not gonna be, they're not gonna use dirty language when they discuss technical things. They respect you to some extent. In open source, it's not true. Nobody knows you, nobody cares about you, almost nobody cares about you, and nobody respects you. For example, uh, the research, they're saying that toxic language in open source can manifest in multiple ways. It, ways. it could be hate speech, it could be microaggression, it could be uh, open source specific display, displays of entitlement and urgency related to timing expectation. This is urgency related to timing means that when you're not completing something, some piece, some functionality, some feature, and you, for example, have an, a framework in open source, that they just join your your framework, they just open the bug request or a feature request or a bug, and they just start, start saying there like, what the hell is, is, is wrong with you? Like, do it now, immediately, we need this feature. And when they need it, they're gonna use all kinds of languages to, 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 to push you forward. And they say that this, is, this toxic language is um, manifests in multiple ways, including hate speech. So be prepared for that, that's my recommendation. So when you, when you go there, don't walk away when you see people being negative about you, and they will be negative about you, especially when you are just a newcomer. You have no reputation, you have no profile, you have no big repositories which, which everybody knows because they're your repositories. They will not like you, and be prepared for the toxic language. Uh, another research says that it's just fresh research, you see, it's just last year. So they say that... Uh, Demeaning complaints, arrogance, insults are common forms of toxicity within open source, you see? So they write papers because this is specific for open source. It's not common. It's not, they're not just saying within software engineering. That would sound strange. Like why would within, well, we are programmers, toxic people. No, open source programmers are quite toxic people. And not toxic people, they're just toxic behavior. So I believe that's my personal understanding that in real life these programmers in, in, in normal projects when they sit in the room they are normal people but when they go open source they believe that nobody can touch them they probably or they just know that that the connection connection is very uh, very long distance between them and the real pro and, and the actual uh, the, re the, the, the person who they talk to that's why they kind of don't care. Another interesting observation. These guys, they, uh, it's also two years ago, they conducted a survey of emails which are uh, happening in the Linux kernel mailing list. You know that Linux is probably one of the uh, strangest projects in the world, open source. They don't deal with changes in GitHub like normal people, but they expect people to send them changes in, in so-called so patch files in the mailing list. And then there's a guy, uh, who is uh, making the decision about what to do with these patches and apply them or not apply. And they reject some, some, some changes and they will reject your changes as well. If you want to make some change to Linux kernel, I, I encourage you to try and you will see the reaction. So most probably your change will be rejected at, uh, for sure at the first try. Maybe if you try a number of times, then eventually they will accept it. So they analyzed uh, about 1500 emails of that kind uh, which are associated with rejected changes. So they just look at, at all the emails with rejections and they found out that more than half of them include uncivil, uh, of non-technical emails, un uh, included uncivil features. Uncivil features meaning the features of the, uh, they were using these features to, to, uh, to analyze the data set. So that's probably related to, to machine learning. So uncivil means that the behavior was uh, was expressed in a way which civilized people don't express their emotions, like frustration, name calling, impatience, uh, are the most frequent features in such emails. 
name calling. So they use, you, you write, I, we can understand that, right? So when you write something at home, there is no, uh, nobody asking you to do that. That's first. Nobody is paying you for that. So you are acting out of enthusiasm. Plus you remember that if your changes will be accepted in Linux mailing list, in the Linux kernel, then you will be able to claim at the interview that you are, you are the elite programmer in the world because your changes are in the Linux kernel. In my life, I've seen only two programmers like that physically, face to face, only two people I've seen who were able to claim, who were able to show me the changes that were accepted to the Linux kernel. And these guys, they were asking big salaries. So they, they believed that they, were, they, they cost a lot. One of them we, we hired, another one we didn't hire, but not because he was not good, but because we were not able to pay him enough. So that's the position you want to be in, in five years. So you write a change to the Linux kernel, right? Because you want to be paid well. And then your change is rejected because blah, blah, blah. They explain you somehow. Of course, you get angry, right? Because you invested your time. You, you, you tried enthusiastically, altruistically, and so on and forth. So you express, so you start name falling, which is... Probably understandable, but not acceptable. So prepare for the name calling to you. So they will call you. They will aggressively uh, use the aggression, aggressive language towards you. Don't worry about it. Don't be offended. Don't be discouraged. Don't walk away. Keep, keep working with them. Keep being there. And to summarize this point, uh, be prepared, but... We need to understand that most open source projects, they fail. And probably is one of the reasons why they fail is because people cannot communicate well in the open source community. So people are different. They don't see each other. They are remote. They use toxic language. You can imagine what happens in the end. They just walk away, never build something together. So most probably your first projects will be your project solo projects. So you will be just the only developer there. Or you join already existing projects and then you just try to get into the community, which is already built after some luck, after some long period of time. Recommendation number three. We're getting more practical. That was just two quite philosophical recommendations just to get you a taste of what's What's open source? When you talk to somebody in GitHub, I strongly encourage you to start your message with the nickname of the person who you talk to. And I will show you an example right now. This is, this is a, a, a conversation in the GitHub history, which happened just a few days ago, where two programmers are talking to each other. There are only two people involved in the conversation. And you see that every time the person makes a message to another person, the person uses the name of that, of that person. Another, the reply starts with the name. Reply starts with the name. Reply starts with the name. You absolutely must do the same. While many people don't. Many people just join the conversation where like five people participate and they just type a message. Like it's Telegram. Like it's, a, like it's a common chat, but it's not. So every message, you, has to, you have to address it to somebody from this conversation, or maybe even outside of the conversation. When you want to invite somebody to the conversation, you start your message with the name of the person. Maybe sometimes you can use two names, but I do not recommend doing that. I recommend using one name. Every time you message something, every time you say something, talk to one person. Like oppose that person. You ask somebody something or you uh, comment to somebody, but you make your message personal. If you don't, what's the outcome? Your message will be lost. First of all, me personally, I have more than 100 repositories on GitHub. And I'm getting maybe two, maybe 300 emails every day from GitHub. I don't read them. You can imagine that, right? So I'm not going to read three or five. I don't know, a lot. They go directly to, to, the, to the, um, the delete to the trash, to the trash bin immediately. I have a, I have a filter configured in my, in my in Gmail, which just, as long as the GitHub emails come in, comes in, it just goes directly to trash bin. 
because it's impossible to read them, right? So I have another filter which tries to, I have even the special software which I created for myself many years ago, which only catches the messages which has my name. So if the message has my name, my nickname there, then it goes into a special folder. And these messages I read. So if you just go to my opens like one of my projects, find some ticket there and send the message to me there, I'm not going to read it because I, I, I'm not going to get it. That's it. And maybe for people who have very small amount of uh, code on GitHub, if they really read all the emails from GitHub, yes, you can just say whatever and they will read it. But for, for people who are more active there, it's definitely not the case. So you have to start. That's one reason. Reason number one is that your message will be lost. And I have many situations where people send pull requests to me and they stay there with no attention for a year. And then I get, get to this project and I see, oh, that's a pull request one year ago. Why didn't I pay attention? Because my name was not mentioned there. So they submit the pull request, it goes to the trash bin, and that's it. So when you submit a pull request, tag somebody who you, who you expect to pay attention to the pull request. And the same for the bug report. When you report a bug, find out who is the guy, who is the main guy in this project, and tag that person and say, please pay attention. And then this guy will deal with this, with this pull request and, and uh, dispatch it somehow, maybe assign it to another person. And in the conversation as well. Another reason why it's important, when you talk to a person specifically, and that person feels obliged to reply to you. If you say just to everybody, then just everybody can ignore you and nobody can feel guilty about it. It's like me talking to you. I'm saying, hey, please stand up. Who? Everybody will sit. But if I address specifically and I say, you, please stand up, of course you're going to stand up. The same your behavior in the, in the conversation. When you say something, I believe this bug must be fixed immediately. Yeah, okay, all right. Who cares? There are five people there who just, yeah, yeah, probably. But not, you're not talking to me. So address it to the architect of the project. Address it, address it to the main person there. And then you'll get the reaction. So that's very obvious for me, but so unobvious to so many people who join uh, open source our projects. So don't be like them. Commendation number four. When you have an argument with somebody, and you will, and these arguments will be toxic, like we just saw, right? Like we just, like we, like the data which we, uh, which we've seen. Uh, in order to make it less toxic, in order to help you to win the argument, I recommend you to uh, uh, to support your point with the links to external materials, which so many people don't do. I've seen many conversations, many arguments in GitHub where people trying to, uh, to convince each other what's right and what's wrong. And this is what most technical debates are about, about convincing each other what, what should be done. Like I submit a pull request, you get it, you read it, you disagree, you think it should be done differently, but I think it should be done the way I've done it. And then what? Then we start discuss, discussing, we start debating, we start arguing. And who wins? One of us has to win, or maybe we need to find a compromise, something like this. So the, the person who is prepared to support the argument with the links, with the materials, which, which stay outside of, the, of GitHub, which stay somewhere on the website, somewhere on the books, then that person has bigger chances to win. So just debating and just explaining your opinion over and over again and writing long texts and, 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 uh, and, and trying to prove your point, you're going to only increase the frustration of yourself and of the people who read you. So a more practical outcome of this recommendation, have those links prepared. So if you see that your, that your understanding of what's right, what's wrong in a technical, in a technical domain is a bit different from what other people believe, then have a list of, of links which you use when it's important. You just take them, you just post it and say, I think that this function must be using the algorithm which is the best one uh, among all other algorithms. They say, how do you know? 
no, this is not the best one. We know what is the best one. We already have this implementation. Then you say, well, this is the blog post where it's explained. Maybe even your own blog post. Maybe even you can find Stack Overflow question answer which supports that. Something like that. But the more you type, the more you put the, uh, the, the, the larger the text you put there in your conversations, the, the weaker is your point. That's what my experience tells me. So the strongest points they're always make with the, they're always made with links, with the references to uh, to some information which is which is outside of the of the conversation. But that's just a recommendation to make you less toxic than other people, because people are toxic, and you will lose your patience again. This this lecture is about debating in GitHub. We're gonna we in, in in future lectures we're gonna discuss how to make pull requests. Then we're going to discuss how to review pull requests. Then we will discuss how to make bug reports the right way so that they will be accepted, so that people are going to fix your bugs instead of just keeping them in the backlog for, for years. But now we're discussing how to debate, how to have a conversation in GitHub so that you get what you want. And mostly you will get what? You're going to get either fixes or you're going to get your fixes accepted. That's two kinds of conversations. So you're going to be either on the side where you uh, reject somebody or on the side where you are the one who is being rejected. So if you're always accepted, then this lecture, you're not, you don't need it. You, you just, your changes that just will be accepted. But there will be cases when you submit and you get rejected. Submit and, and even the worst situation when you submit your changes and you get no reaction. They just wait, they just ignore you. They just say, yeah, interesting, we'll take a look at it and just wait for a month. This is the worst situation. If they reject, at least they explain to you. Well, there, we, will, we will see that, that sometimes people even reject with no explanation. They just reject and that's it, for some reasons which, they, which, they, which we don't know. But usually in open source, they, they explain why and what's going on. So your job is to, your, your, your dream is to is to be always accepted and to, and to have the power to reject other changes with the proper explanation. And links and the materials which you prepare before you go into the, the, the conversations will be your uh, helpers. That's what's going to make you stronger. Okay? So read, read books. Well, books is not the best, actually, because from the books, the book is not possible to quote. Well, you can quote the book, but you cannot provide the link. So Stack Overflow answers is a way more powerful instrument. So even if you don't have the link and you want to you want to you want to prove your point, then instead of texting, just go Google it, find a relevant link, and post it there. It will make your 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 explanation stronger. While most people don't understand it, that's that's just my uh, I'm taking this from from my practical frustration of dealing with people who are who get angry because we reject them and they cannot, they cannot prove the opposite and, and I can see that they, they just miss the idea, just go find the link. That's how you're gonna kill my argument. You just show me, hey, look what I found in this book. How can you beat that? In this case, I'm, I'm disarmed. I, I, I have to well, find another book, but I'm not gonna do that in most cases. I will probably say, well, yeah, you're right to some extent, so let's find a compromise. But if it's just me, if it's just you sitting in front of me, well, actually you, I don't know where, sitting in front of me in the ticket, and you have your point, well, I have my point. And I'm the architect here, for example. I'm the owner of this repository. So why should I listen to you? Well, blah, blah, blah. But you're going to drag somebody to the conversation, some bigger guy, some author of the book, some author of, the, of some Stack Overflow answer. And then I become way more vulnerable in this case, way more unstable. So I can surrender probably. Okay. Point number five, my favorite uh, among these seven today. You have to have a profile in GitHub and you should start it, you should make an avatar in it and it should be anthropomorphic. And I will show you the research which confirms that, but that was my intuition. But after this intuition, I did some research and I found a number of papers which actually say the same. But let me first start with my intuition. 
When somebody sends me the code in GitHub, and there is no profile and even no avatar, so I have no nothing, not the face of the person, maybe like a Mickey Mouse there, but nothing. My trust to this account is way lower than I would have a trust to the person who invested some time into building the profile. Why? Because I understand that that person most probably is not interested to stay in this GitHub for longer, is not interested to be the long-time contributor, is not interested to build the profile of GitHub. Is, this person probably doesn't have this altruistic, but not altruistic, motivation to build up the open source presence because there is not even the face of that person there. So why should I consider that, 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 that person as a, as a serious, serious uh, contributor? So every time uh, you are there, think about and, and this actually very typical to students. Maybe because you don't care, maybe because you don't have time, maybe because you just, just joined GitHub and you don't understand what it's for. Some teacher told you that. But if you are planning to become a software engineer, if you're planning to become a programmer, if you're planning to make money as a programmer, you need to think about how to get more money from the employer, right? That's the objective. So you want to work for bigger salary eventually. How to get there? You're going to bring bigger profile to them. The profile with more contribution, with the Linux kernel contribution. How do you get there? You build a beautiful profile first. That will show trust to people. They will, that will show your credibility to people where you send your pull request. And they will accept it faster, as we will see now in the research. For example, research number one, 2005. That was done, uh, how many? Like, uh, not 20, almost 20 years ago. So they say that avatars, they were analyzing, not GitHub, they were analyzing just conversations in social networks, but it doesn't matter. So they say avatars that were anthropomorphic, so the face of a person, of a human, not the Mickey Mouse, not the, uh, you know, something else, but a, a human being, were perceived to be more attractive and credible. That's what you want, credibility. You send the code to me. I don't know you. I haven't seen you ever. I don't know where you're from. I don't know how you look. I don't know nothing about you. So your job is to get credibility, to get trust from me. So show your face. That's what they say. And also what's interesting is that uh, what's important in the avatar is that there is, there is a lack of androgenity. So lack of, so we need to know either you are a, 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 a female or a male. So it's important for credibility as well. So make it look. It doesn't, it doesn't need to be you. It doesn't need to be your face. You can put any face there. I've seen many profiles where people just put some face there. But even the face with George Clooney is better than no face. Even if you are a, a 20 years old lady, put the face of George Clooney. It will even better than you put no face there. That's it. You can make any fake, fake face there, but, but something. Another interesting research in the same di uh, direction is that uh, about gender. So we just discussed that it's important to show gender, female or male. But this is, I, just, I was just researching this topic and I found this interesting paper. It was, it's quite fresh. They say that um, if a contribution is coming from a, ma a woman, uh, then it's going to be accepted more often if this person is from inside the is from inside from the community. So let's say they have an open source project and they have men and women, and then when the woman submits a pull request, we accept it faster. We accept it with more desire. But if it's an outside contributor, so we don't know who it is, and it's just like let's say it's my open source project and somebody sends me the pull request. I have no idea who it is. I've never seen that person. I see it's a woman. I'm going to be more skeptical about the, uh, this contribution. This is what the research says. So if you are building a profile, you put George Clooney. When you're already there, <laughs> you, put, uh, you put a female face, something like that. I'm joking, but that's what the research says. So it's a different attitude towards, towards different genders. We need to understand. And this, is, this actually is relevant, this topic is relevant to the, to the, to the toxic, uh, in, in toxic nature of the environment. So, of course, it's not really, uh, it's not really a healthy 
situation. So the different attitude to different genders, this may discourage, for example, women to send pull requests and may discourage uh, men when they, when they work in, the, in, the, in an established community. They say, hey, there, there, there are women. Women requests are faster accepted, so it's not, it's not fair to me. And the other way around about uh, outsiders. But, uh, but we have it. This is also an indicator of toxic environment in, in open source. Unfortunately, another interesting research, which I also found when I was uh, interested about this uh, uh, GitHub situation and, uh, and, uh, and, and perception of uh, our profiles. So they found out just, just recently, a few years ago, that if you identify, again, identify, so we don't know who you are. We don't know what is your real identity, if it's George Clooney or, or Barack Obama, for example. So they're saying that uh, if we, uh, if if you look like Hispanic or black, then uh, then you are 39% of pull requests rejected, which is about 10% points more frequent than the rest perceptive races. So there is some sort of racism in GitHub. It exists. It exists in people. It exists on GitHub, but maybe virtually people express it even more uh, openly. So if they feel something about people of different race, they have no problem uh, like demonstrating this behavior on GitHub. In real life, they would probably be more concerned about that. They would not say like, ah, you're black, don't enter this room. But in GitHub, they can do that. Or you're Hispanic, your pull request stays later. We're going to deal with it later. We're going to first open pull requests from other people. So on GitHub, this stuff exists, which is definitely not what we are proud of, we members of GitHub, but we need to understand that this, that this stuff is uh, there. And this is probably the last slide about this um, the avatar and, and profile situation. Um, here they say something strange, so I wasn't able to fully understand this conclusion of the article, but they say that if you're a new employee, um, so being a new employee is not a significant predictor of any of our feelings of pushback. So basically, they say in the first, in the first statement, they say it doesn't matter whether you're a new person who makes the contribution or you already were in this company or community. But then, immediately, they say, compared to authors at level one, which are like, like you, like junior developers, and authors at level three, for example, like me. So you're going to be less likely to see conflict. Uh, authors at level three are, we, uh, more, uh, more experienced uh, authors, we will less likely see conflict in our code review changes. So basically, as far as I understand, the second statement says that the more experienced I am, the less problems I will get when I submit my code. So the team will just respect me. So I am here for many years, for example, in this project, or I am in this company for many years, and then I write code, I submit it. I'm not going to get as much uh, conflicts, as much uh, suggestions to improve my code as a junior guy who just joined the, the, the community. I don't know why it's statistically not a significant predictor, but it's like 28%. I think it's quite significant predictor of, uh, of, uh, of, this, uh, of our feelings of pushback. Anyway, it's, I don't understand exactly, but I know that this is, this is definitely true. So it definitely happens. When you will join a project as a student, as a fresh graduate, and uh, you will see people who work in this project for 10 years, so be prepared that your changes will be, uh, will be uh, perceived way more, with way, with way more uh, concerns, way more negativity. They're going to they're gonna review your code uh, with a magnifying glass. And it happens to me too. Like I, I am a, in, in, a, in a number of projects, I'm the architect. So I, I founded those code bases. So I created them and I know almost everything there. And there are new guys who just joined maybe half a year ago. So, of course, when I submit a pull request, nobody's going to argue with me. Well, they try, but 
they do it very polite way, very like, oh, maybe I'm wrong here, but could you please tell me why you did this and that? And I'm just saying, yeah, because I believe it's right. And, okay, okay. But if they submit the code, then I have all the uh, frivolity, all the freedom to, uh, to be as negative as possible. Again, it's not good. It's absolutely not something which we're proud of in the open source community, but that's the reality. So be prepared for that. Be prepared for, be, for, be, for being judged by how you look online, by how old you are, whether you're a man or a woman, all of that will matter in open source community, which is very toxic, but that's true. And then I want to show you the profile, which I believe is perfect in GitHub. It's, I don't know who is she. I don't know what kind of code she writes, but uh, this profile I found a number of years ago when I was writing a blog post about uh, how to make your GitHub presence more effective. And I found the profile of this Monica, and um, she's got, uh, I believe, more than 3,000 followers, which is an important indicator of your popularity on GitHub. This is number one indicator. The more followers you have, the more people follow you, like on Facebook, like on uh, Twitter, the more people follow you on GitHub, the better programmer you are. Well, in, in most cases. Of course, there are people who are being followed for no reason, but that's, that's corner cases. But if like 3,000 people follow you, and definitely you write something which community cares about. And when you come for an employer asking for, for a job, and if I would be an employer, I would open your profile and you've got 3.5 thousand like this Monica, I would have no concern about your programming abilities, about your ability to be a member of the team, ability to deal with negativity, ability to, you know, to organize projects, maybe even to manage projects. I would not even have questions for you at the interview. I would not ask you to please write the code for me. I just see everything right there. So this profile is just amazing. So she's got everything filled up. The avatar, the, the, the location, the emails, the links to Twitter. This is the front page, the details. Hello, I'm Monica, all the emojis. We're going to talk about emojis a bit later. They also matter, what's interesting. That's an introduction. I'm a software developer. I'm passionate about blah, blah, blah. Here is where you can find me. That's the continuation of the page. You see the contribution. So she's making something almost every day. So she's active there, she's got repositories, not super popular repositories, you see there are just a number of stars here, like 44, 20, 100. So the repositories of Monica are not super popular. So she's probably not writing something which is important for the community. So you, you have to understand that the number of stars people give you to your repositories is even more important than the amount of followers you have. But in case of repository, it's not in, in, it's not always directly connected to who you are. For example, I have a number of repositories which I was creating until they got like a hundred stars. And then, and now they have like 600 stars. So these 500 stars, it's not my contribution. It's the contribution of other people who continue to work after me. So when you see this repository, you may say, oh, wow, that's him. He, he's working, he continues to work, and that's why the community is not true. But in case of Monica, 40, 100, she doesn't have uh, like repositories with thousands of, of stars, which, like I told you, is very important. So if you have a repository with many stars, it means that you're making a valuable contribution to the community. So people care about what you write. Of course, we have repositories on GitHub which have thousands or tens of thousands of stars, but the value of them is not so important uh, in terms of a programming effort. For example, we have so many so-called uh, awesome lists where people just list interesting stuff. They call it awesome something. And these this lists, they get like 10,000 stars in one overnight. But it doesn't mean that the, the people who are creating them are good programmers. So if you come to me for an interview and I want to hire you, I'm not going to only ask how many stars your repositories have, but I will look at your followers and I will look at what kind of repositories are there. For example, in my account in GitHub, the most popular repository I created in just one day. It's just a very simple CSS framework, which was super easy to make. I spent like really exactly one day of work, but I've got like about 
1,600 stars there, and it's alive for the, for the last, I think, nine or 10 years. But if you look at this repository, you will think that I'm a CSS designer, that I'm a CSS programmer, which is absolutely not the case. I'm very not skilled in, in CSS programming. So it happens. But you have to still pay a lot of attention to how you look. So just see how, and even look, she, doesn't, she also has a sponsors. On GitHub, there's a feature where people can sponsor you. So they can kind of send you money every month automatically for the work you do. It's a very interesting feature. <clears throat> the more sponsors you have, of course, the better you look for, for us. So think about GitHub as a Facebook for developers. You have to be there. You have to be visible. It's, even, it's way more important for you than Facebook. It's way more important than, than Twitter or Instagram. We, we, we employers, we don't care about your Twitter presence, but we care a lot about your GitHub presence. So don't forget about that and take it seriously. Recommendation number six. I strongly suggest you, when you work in open source, and not only in open source, when you work in your projects and your repositories, you stay in the tickets. You don't, you, you try to resolve all the questions. You try to discuss everything inside your GitHub issues and pull requests. Even if you know the person personally, even if you know that the, 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 the telegram contact of this guy, even if you know him and, and he's sitting next to you, the same, the same room, Try, which happens to us, for example. We, we developed a software, and, and some of us, we sit next to each other in, in, in the company. But our repository is in GitHub. And I always tell my, my fellow programmers, who, who are my colleagues, don't ask me the questions here. Ask it on GitHub. Because when you ask there, and I provide the answer there, the conversation stays there for future generation, for us in the future. For me and you who will forget what we discussed before, we will get back to this discussion again and you will see my answer, you will see your question. There are so many reasons why it's important, but reason number one, I'm just improvising now, reason number one, we want all the conversations and all decisions made, we want them to see in writing, so we don't want to forget them. This is like, a, like, a, like keeping the story, like keeping the history in writing. That's important for... Uh, for traceability of the project. So we're always going to know why certain decision was made. Another reason, when we talk in writing, we write better. And this is the confirmation for that. Let me show you. That was very old research, 20 years ago. No, 30 years ago. Uh, the research found out that they were, they, were, they were studying the conversations between students and not exactly about programming, but the summary is still very relevant to us. They say that uh, when people talk in computer mode, they say computer mode, meaning chats, meaning uh, digital conversations, instead of face-to-face -face like we're talking now. So this is not a computer mode. I'm just talking to you, you're asking me questions, and we're lucky that we have a, a camera recording us. But in most cases, people don't record their conversations. You ask me something, I give you the answer, it's gone. We don't know exactly what was said. This is what the research said, that people, when they communicate in computer mode, they are more responsible for, the, for, the, for their communications because they know that, they, uh, that everything they say is being written and probably going to be read by other people. So we get more responsible, we use more formal and more complex language, we structure our thoughts better, so we become more professional. And this is what's important, this is what helps us. So when you are tempted to jump from the discussion in GitHub to personal discussion, to Telegram, to even the phone call, don't do it. And this is what I see so many times among young programmers. Not only young programmers, every programmer. Actually, actually maybe experienced programmers are doing it even more often, I would say. Because they believe that, okay, I'm going to explain it to you better, faster. Hey, just call me. So I'm tired of, of, of explaining all of that in writing. I'm just sick of that. Just make me a call. Come to my room. I'll tell you everything. This is unprofessional behavior. If you see people, technical people doing that, if they tell you, stop writing, I'm, I'm, I'm sick of that discussion, come to me, we'll talk face-to-face. Face-to-face is always better. A meeting is always better than writing. 
Absolutely not. Don't buy that. A conversation, a technical conversation must be in writing, not in uh, not in, uh, in a face-to-face. Face-to-face, you can discuss in which restaurant you're going to go. You can discuss what kind of pizza you're going to eat. You can discuss what's going to be the, the, the format of our lectures. Like, let's decide. Let's meet each other. Let's discuss life. Let's discuss who uses which programming language. But when we need to discuss what kind of changes needs to be done to the pull request, we absolutely must stay within the pull request, even if we sit next to each other in the office. Even in this case, a screenshot from the paper which I just showed you, there they say that what people think, what students think about two ways of communicating. So just like I asked you what you prefer now, what kind of lectures you prefer, and you said, most of you said that online is better than offline, uh, it's quite similar to what uh, students were saying 30 years ago. So for example, I can express myself freely. So in face-to-face -face communications, they cannot express themselves freely. Why? Because it's a, it's a social and psychological pressure on them. So when I talk to somebody who looks more superior than me, for example, who is older, who is more senior, who, who blah, 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 then I will feel a little bit uh, less comfortable explaining what I think. And not everybody is, uh, is uneasy in communicating and freely communicating to other people, especially among us programmers. Most of us are computer guys and we are quite introverts and face-to-face -face communication for us is, is hard in, in most cases. We are okay to talk to people who we know quite well, but if it's a random people in the office, if it's people who we didn't know before, then we don't feel comfortable uh, talking to them and, and uh, aggressively defending our positions, technical positions. So that's why it's way better to have electronic discussion where I can defend my position no matter how I look, no matter how old I am, no matter what is my gender, no matter anything. It's all, all that matters is what I say. All that matters is what kind of information I, what kind of argument I can give, how smart I am. That's all, that, 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 this is all that matters. And for example this, I feel stress. You see, in face-to-face -face communic discussions, they feel stress way more often than in electronic discussion. Do we need stress in, in, in our GitHub tickets? We don't need stress. We need smart opinions. We need smart decisions. So we need to make comfortable environment for people. But face-to-face -face discussions make discussions uncomfortable, make them difficult to to handle for the majority of us programmers. So my recommendation to you is teach yourself how to explain everything you have in mind in writing. So learn Markdown. You know that in GitHub they use Markdown format to, to, uh, to format their, their opinions. You need to learn that language, you need to learn that format and use it. So make sure your, your messages look beautiful. Not only, we're going to discuss it later when we're going to discuss how to report bugs. I will tell you more about Markdown and explain what you should use in Markdown, what you shouldn't use in Markdown. But now the overall suggestion is to make sure every message you write looks like, looks very convincing. Don't be negligent. Don't be, uh, pay attention to how you formulate, how you format your messages. This is important. And, and teach yourself. I'm not going to teach you now how to do it. My message is that uh, understand that if you cannot explain it digitally, you have to do it, you have to train yourself. Don't escape to face-to-face to -face communications. That's what most people believe. They say, ah, it's hard to do it in writing. That's why we do face-to-face. -face. This logic is broken. It shouldn't be like this. It's hard to do it in writing, we still do it in writing. We train ourselves, we find a way to do it in writing. We don't change uh, written communication, digital communication, to face-to-face -to -face because face-to-face -face is better. No, face-to-face -face is worse. So if you're making this jump, you're just, um, you surrender and, and just uh, uh, admitting that you're unprofessional. You're just saying, well, I'm not a professional programmer. I have no idea how to explain it in writing. I don't know English. I don't know Markdown. I can't use diagrams. I'm sorry. Let's do face-to-face -face meeting. This message, I would understand if somebody tell me this in the office. Come to me and say, you know, I'm stupid, so let's talk face to face. I would say, okay, you're stupid, that's right, let's sit down. And... But nobody says that. They just come and say, hey, it's easier, it's better, we're in the same office, let's do face to face. Great, we're professionals. 
This is not the right message. The right message, you know, I'm stupid, you're stupid, we're both in, incompetent people, we cannot write it properly, so let's do face-to-face. -face. Understand the logic? That's what I'm trying to, to deliver to you, that message. And uh, there's a small, uh, interesting paper just last year published. They, they just made a quick summary of uh, what kind of channels uh, developers use. So people uh, in, in open source repositories not only use uh, issues or tickets, as I call them, for communication. They all use different channels of communication. And you should be prepared to be in these different channels, to communicate there digitally, still digitally. These channels have different priority. So I would suggest to, uh, to select them carefully, to understand that some of them are better, some of them are worse, but there are many of them. Issues, Slack channels, mailing lists, wikis, uh, pull requests, uh, they say uh, not phone calls. There, there, there is a list of, of, of uh, communication channels which different open source projects allow their developers to use. My recommendation is to use only issues. So don't use discussions which exist on GitHub, don't use uh, wiki pages. I think all of that is uh, other just instruments which are less effective than tickets. In the tickets, it's better to debate, to discuss questions inside the tickets. The ticket has a number, the ticket has a title, the ticket has a description of the problem which we discuss. It it explains what we're trying to achieve, and then we are trying to achieve it. We just go step by step, putting all the opinions into a, into a timeline, and in the end, we made a conclusion. We closed the ticket. This is the date of the problem when it was created. This is the date when the problem was solved. And this timeline of, time of solving the problem, it only exists in the ticket. It doesn't exist in Slack conversation. In Slack, it's a blah, blah, blah. So you start, we talk, we discuss, you post something, I post something, you reply to me, I reply to you. Where is the beginning? Where is the end? We don't know. It's just a free conversation where nobody is responsible for anything. In the ticket, we have an author of the ticket. We know who started the problem. We know who solved the problem, who closed the ticket. So these two people, they are responsible for the whole picture. In Slack, Nobody is responsible for anything. It's just blah, 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 where people just mostly waste their time and pretend to be working. You know, I, um, there was a story a few years ago when uh, some people were fired massively in some companies, an IT company. Probably it was here in Russia. I'm not sure. Uh, but the main uh, motivator for firing people was the amount of Slack messages they post. So they just built the statistics of who made how many messages in the Slack internal uh, conversation channels. And if there is no messages, then you fire it. So you, you didn't say anything over the last year. So that's why you didn't work. In my opinion, that's a broken logic. So I would say people who don't post messages there are the people who work. Because being in these channels, talking there, this is definitely not an indicator of your performance, of your productivity. The amount of tickets in GitHub that you closed, yes, this could be the, the indicator of your, of your contribution. The more tickets you close, the better programmer you are, the more, the, more, the more problems you solved. To some extent, of course, we can also say that you maybe created too many noisy tickets and then we closed them for no reason and you made them for no reason, so what kind of programmer you are. Yes, that kind of uh, situations may exist. But overall, if you look at the average, then I would say the people who are more active in, in tickets are, uh, on average, more active, more uh, important contributors to the project. The final uh, message from me to you, be polite. In the conversations, like we discussed, the community is very toxic. They're going to they're gonna judge you by your... Uh, by your, uh, by by many many factors about you which have no relation to your real performance, but still you have to be polite and when you disagree and so on. So now a few funny papers which are also quite fresh. Last year, they say developers who use emojis in their posts are significantly less likely to drop out from the online work platform. So if you well, there is a correlation. If you use emojis, then we see that these people are more attached to the project community. They kind of feel more, uh, feel more probably more fun in what they do. They they feel more, uh, they associate probably themselves with the community. 
I don't understand how they are correlated, but maybe I need to encourage you to use emojis in order to get attached to, to the place where you work. Also interesting uh, about, uh, or oh, maybe this, this, this quote should be staying in the, in the where we discussed the profile. Okay, maybe I put it in the wrong place. So you see, they say they found that women didn't provide more information on competence, were not generally married at a stricter standard. So they, they compared many uh, profiles on GitHub of women and men. And, um, uh, and it's funny, they found that women uh, provide, we saw Monica, Monica provided a lot of information, but on average, women provide less information in their profiles, men provide more information. And what's interesting, Women express less politeness and less profanity. So not so rude as men, but not so polite as men. So women stay more within the sort of, uh, you know, within the, closer to the center, and men are either very rude or very polite. It's interesting, but that's, the, that's their uh, discovery on GitHub. Also interesting finding, uh, they say that uh, they call it gravity in online collaborations. So by gravity they mean uh, that people um, from uh, different very far places in the world are less likely to work together in GitHub project. So if you are from here and another guy is from Canada and another guy is from France, then from France guy has bigger chances to work with you in GitHub than the person from Canada because the distance is bigger. Some sort of co correlation exists. That's what they say. So it does matter. So there is a gravity. So the longer you are, the, the longer the distance, the, the weaker the gravity. So there's, they, you don't, uh, don't want to work together or you don't, or maybe, maybe you want, but you don't work. They just, they just observe the, ref, the, the facts. They observe the, re, the, uh, the final... Uh, the numbers they can find on GitHub, they say that people tend to, uh, to collaborate uh, according to the distance between them to some extent, which is also interesting. So when you see a project which, where most of the developers are, let's say, from Canada, then maybe you should be prepared for, uh, for, for, for spending bigger effort in order to get into this community. But if you see that the community is from, I don't know, from Moscow, and from Kazan, then definitely this community is more attractive to you. Uh, it will be easier for you to join this community because the, the, the physical distance is smaller. I'm not sure what do you mean by community. Oh, well, let's say it's a project where you have like 25 contributors. So that's the community. So they all commit, commit, commit. So you open the GitHub repository and you see there are 25 people actively committing. So you want to join. You also want to commit there. But you see that most of these people are from Canada. Be prepared, it's going to be a bit a challenge for you to get in there because it's far away. That's what the paper says. And it's also interesting, this is a political stuff. They actually wrote it three years ago. They say that uh, these people are from uh, the author of the paper from Germany. Uh, the study says that they studied the Ukrainian-Russian conflict and they say that... Uh, uh, after the conflict, actually it was before the current conflict, it was 2019, so the conflict was the, the previous one, and they say that the conflict actually has a negative effect on the collaboration on GitHub, which is also you need to take into account. So GitHub is not a completely virtual community, it's not a completely virtual platform. People are people, they live in certain countries, so when they see your, let's say, your flag there, and you put your flag which attributes you to some country, be prepared that people with another country, they may be, uh, you know, they may be resentment, they, they may express some resentment to your contribution. And they studied that there is a uh, negative effect on overall collabor collaboration as measured by, uh, by Ukrainian and Russian projects. So they identify these projects. You can read the paper how exactly they identify them, but uh, the, the, the tension is, is obvious. This is another study. They ask the question, uh, which contributions predict whether developers are accepted into GitHub team or not? They ask questions. If you have more activity on GitHub, if in your profile we can see that you contribute actively, so you write code every day, and then you send us the pull request, whether we will accept it better, faster, comparing to pull requests coming from people who don't write any code on GitHub. 
So in this paper, they says it depends. So there is not a strong correlation. And this, they say, this underscores the notion that software collaboration is much more than code itself. So people not so much pay attention to the amount of code you write, but they probably pay attention to something different. Maybe the profile of you, maybe your avatar, maybe your, the type, the, the style of, of text you write, maybe the style of your, you know, of your explanation, something like this. This is what they found. I would say I personally disagree with that. So if somebody comes to me with a pull request and I see that that person is an active developer, I would lean towards accepting that pull request because I know that many other pull requests were accepted before by the, from the same person. So I kind of feel that the credibility is higher to that guy in the community comparing to another person who just joined and this is, my, this is his, his first pull request coming to me. So the, the, the trust level is quite low. So with the findings of this paper, I would dispute. And my final slide from uh, Pope Francis, who uh, in his speech eight or nine years ago, he said that there are three words which can save any marriage. And I believe these are the three words which can save any pull request, any ticket on, on, on GitHub, on any ticket on any project. Please, thanks, and sorry. So use these three words to when you communicate. When you want your changes to be accepted, say, please accept my changes. Please consider this bug. Please think about making these changes. When they did it, when they accepted your changes, don't forget to say, thank you very much. Thanks for this. Thanks for having this project. Thanks for accepting my pull request. Thanks for answering me for my changes. I just submitted you my changes. You rejected my changes. Thanks for, co for considering them. Thanks for reviewing my changes. Thanks for investing your time into, into dealing with me, into working with me. Thank people. It will, all, it will cost you nothing, but it will give you a lot of... Uh, for you personally, a lot of comfort, and for them, a lot of uh, appreciation from you. They will feel that they do something for other people, and other people appreciate them. And finally, sorry, if you just did something wrong, just admit it. So don't stay on the position that I never make mistakes. This position only makes you weaker. It doesn't make you stronger. To get a stronger position, it's better to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. I admit it. What do I do next? Correct me. Help me not to make these mistakes in the future. People who are ready to admit their mistakes usually are perceived as way more professional. Unprofessional people are always right. If you're always right, I know that you're an amateur, that you're very weak, that you're afraid to admit that you made a mistake, especially on GitHub. Just say, sorry, I don't understand how your project works. I'm sorry, it's my fault. I don't know how it works. Could you please explain it to me? Oh, of course we can, definitely, because he's already sorry. Or another way you can say, hey, your project is, doesn't work. I demand you explain it to me. Yeah, really. People are not going to be so happy about helping you in this case. So please, thanks, and sorry. These are your three keywords in debating and GitHub.